So let me start our discussion by asking Anthony Lewis, what was it about the Gideon decision that you became so passionate about and that caused you to write so much about it, to write the definitive Gideon's trumpet about it, and really to become one of the great um, uh, stories told ever of a case that came before the Supreme Court? You know, this is all an exercise in reminiscence for me. It's 50 years ago, and uh, I'm searching for memories of that time, and I have quite a few. But I, I, uh, I might quote just a very short passage from my book, which reflects what I felt at the time, probably better than I can remember now. The Chief Justice Earl Warren called on Justice Black to announce his opinion. That was the technique at the Supreme Court then. You look to your right, and he nods, and Chief Justice nods, and Justice Black uh, leans forward in his chair, and he leaned forward, and he said, and what I wrote then was an almost folksy way, he told the story of Clarence Earl Gideon's case. It raised a fundamental question, he said. The rightness of a case we decided 21 years ago, bets against Brady. When we granted certiorari in this case, we asked the lawyers on both sides to argue to us whether we should reconsider that case. We do reconsider Betts and Brady, and we reached an opposite conclusion. Those rather bland words, but not Justice Black's manner, which was anything but bland, really told us that something of rare importance was happening, a case that had become the basis for many, many uh, criminal law cases in the Supreme Court uh, had just disappeared in a whiff because the judges had decided they were wrong at the start. And in many ways, this case could have been decided. But Hugo Black had been on the court since 1937. He dissented in bets against Brady, and he always thought it was an anomaly wrongly decided. The decision then was that you could deny the right to a lawyer if the defendant, the criminal defendant, had, did not have any special circumstances making him uh, disabled for arguing his case. The theory was that he could cross-examine someone or give an opening argument just as well as a lawyer or whatever. Black thought that was just wrong from the start and he never uh, stopped thinking that, and he talked about it a lot in other cases and off the bench. And so when he said those words, uh, now we decide that we were wrong, it had a powerful emotional impact on me because I, I knew about the earlier case at Bess and Brady and all the arguments about it and uh, the pressure to have it reversed, and here suddenly it was being reversed. Uh, it was really a remarkable moment for me, and Justice Black was, a, <coughs> to say a word about him, Justice Black came from Alabama. He spoke in a soft voice, uh, but under that soft voice there was a, uh, a lead club <laughs> with which he would cut your head off if you, if you didn't pay attention. Uh, the, the lawyer for the state of Florida, Bruce Jacob, uh, was arguing that uh, uh, a civilian could do just as well as a lawyer in, in a case of this kind. And uh, uh, someone, I think it was Justice Harlan, asked him, are you saying that uh, uh, he could have represented another defendant just as good as a lawyer? Could he have gone before the court and represented someone else? And uh, Bruce Jacobs said, yes, and Justice Harlan said, don't go too far now. <laughs> <laughs> Justice Black said, if the court didn't object, I suspect some bar associations would have. <laughs> uh, it was both a very human argument and, and a very revealing one. Um, the thing about Justice Black was he was extraordinarily tenacious 
and more decisions were overruled by the Supreme Court in his day, decisions from which he had descended than at any other time. He was, I mean, examples of many, perhaps the most consequential in a way to our political system was that when the, the court in the 1940s had decided that you could not challenge as a denial of constitutional rights the dividing up of the state's districts for purposes of electing members of the legislature in a way that favored some people over others by making them, them have very few people to elect a representative while other areas had, to, uh, had huge populations and almost only the same one representative. Uh, apportionment it was called and it was grotesquely uh, unfair, unequal. Uh, the city of Hartford, the capital of Connecticut, as I recall, had one state uh, uh, representative and the city of Colebrook, Connecticut, which had a population of 500 or so, uh, <laughs> had one representative because they were frozen in time as if we were still back in the 18th century. Um, anyway, that was the decision then. And later, it was overruled <coughs> by the Supreme Court and what Justice Black and Chief Justice Warren thought was the most consequential decision of his time on the court, requiring just about every state to redistribute its uh, legislature uh, to make it fair and equal. But that was Justice Black, and he was the spirit behind this case, I always thought, uh, with you know, many others joining him, obviously. There were no dissents in, in the end. <coughs> but uh, with his feeling, his voice, I kept feeling behind it. I should say that I had a, your, your question was, why did I write it the way I did? Why did I write it with such obvious emotion <coughs> and commitment? <laughs> well, all of those feelings are coming back to me now as I sit here. It's the first time in 50 years I've thought about these things afresh. And um, I was sufficiently interested, but let me put it this way. I'll give you the actual moment when I began taking an interest in this case. Uh, Supreme Court at that time, and I'm not up to date on exactly what the requirements are now, but they wouldn't be much different, required everybody filing, a, making a filing in the Supreme Court in an ordinary case to supply 40 printed copies of that filing, whether it was a brief or a petition or whatever, 40 printed copies. But poor people couldn't do that. So they had a rule that said a poor person could bring a case to the Supreme Court asking for help for him with one copy. And it didn't have to be printed. It didn't even have to be typewritten. It could be handwritten. And Gideon's was handwritten in pencil on, on prison stationery. And when, and when I was covering the court, I had access to all the printed materials all the time. But these handwritten petitions, there was only one copy. And ladies and gentlemen, this was before Xerox was invented. <laughs> <laughs> and so there was only that one copy. And it circulated among the nine justices. And only after they had all read it, uh, did I get to see it. And the day the Supreme Court decided on those petitions, it would have a list of those granted. Very few. Prisoners' petitions, very few were ever granted. Um, and those denied. And this day, there was one case granted. It said Gideon against Wainwright, such and such a number. Um, so I went down to the file room, where this one copy now was lodged, and asked to see it. And I saw it. And I saw right at the beginning that it was, a re it was an unusual request, because it was a letter to the Supreme Court written in pencil by a prisoner. And that was in itself rather a romantic idea. Uh, that you could be in a prison in Rayford, Florida and write a letter to the Supreme Court and think you had any hope of getting into <laughs> your case. Well, he did have a hope, didn't he? It was uh, quite amazing. That was part of the romance to me. And then I had followed the, the ins and outs of Betts and Brady and the reaction to it over the years. And I could see that the fact that the court agreed to hear this case, this extremely obscure case 
from one of the most obscure human beings in the United States, a poor prisoner in a Florida penitentiary. How can you think of anyone more remote and unlikely than that? And the fact that the court had agreed to hear it led me to believe instantly that they were going to reverse Betts and Brady. That's why they took the case. Why would they take another case just to say, we still believe in Betts and Brady? It would be unlikely they would do that. So I thought the likelihood was they were really going to overrule Betts and Brady. Uh, so I immediately, uh, uh, you know, did what I could to, I thought that I could write something longer than a newspaper story about it. So I did what I could to catch up with it. <coughs> the Chief Justice appointed, or the court appointed, Abe Fortas to uh, represent Gideon in the Supreme Court. Now this is a total irony. Gideon could not get a lawyer to represent him in a petty case in Panama City, Florida. <laughs> but he got the best lawyer in the United States to represent him in the Supreme <laughs> Court of the United States. <laughs> that was the irony. It was really hilarious because Abe Fortas was, in my judgment, I can say the best, anybody could be the best, but he was really a hotshot lawyer. Very, very good. I saw him argue a number of cases and he was brilliant. So he went from nowhere to everywhere. And I thought I could make something of it by following his work on the, on the case and also his opponent's work. His opponent, more irony, was a, a young lawyer in his 20s, 26 I think, Bruce Jacob, who working for the Florida Attorney General, who had never seen the United States Supreme Court before, had, had, had no experience in this kind of case, none whatever, and he goes into court against this giant. <laughs> it was the most unequal uh, argument in history, <laughs> maybe, I don't know. Bruce was wonderful and he, would, he was very able and uh, I mean, I think it's honorable. He really believed that poor people should have lawyers when they were charged with crime. But he thought his job working for the Attorney General was to make the best case he could uh, against that view, and he did. Well, so we're going to get into a discussion in a bit about... If I go on too long, you've got to shut me up. Oh, no, <laughs> you have me from the beginning. Um, we're going to talk uh, quite a bit about the 50 years since the Gideon decision, whether it was a promise fulfilled or partially fulfilled or, or unfulfilled.